So today's webinar again, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the mental health of older adults. A longitudinal analysis from the CLSA is being presented by Dr. Parminder Reina. Dr. Reina is the lead principal investigator of the CLSA, the scientific director of the McMaster Institute for Research on Aging, and a professor in the Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact at McMaster. He holds a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Geroscience and the Raymond and Margaret Labarge Chair in Research and Knowledge Application for Optimal Aging. Uh, he specializes in the epidemiology of aging with em emphasis on developing the interdisciplinary field of geroscience to better understand aging from cell to society. So without further ado, I will pass it on to off to Perminder. Great, thanks, Jennifer. Shirley, do I have the control now? Yeah, you're good to go. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you everyone for joining us uh, this afternoon to hear what I have to say. And uh, uh, as uh, Jennifer introduced that, I'm gonna be talking about some of the data we have been analyzing from the CLSA COVID questionnaire data. And uh, I'm here on behalf of the uh, main team members who actually designed and helped launch the uh, CLSA COVID-19 uh, questionnaire uh, study, plus who are also members of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And so I'm speaking on behalf of them. And I couldn't uh, say more uh, or enough about our participants. And we have incredible group of CLSA participants who have contributed to all aspects of the CLSA and especially the, the CLSA COVID-19 study and how quickly we launched this study and what type of responses we got is, is really uh, something to be admired and we are very thankful to their participation. And none of this would have been done without our staff across the country through these very difficult, challenging times working from home, dealing with parents and dealing with their children at the same time. So our uh, full thank you and appreciation goes to all of our staff across the country. So, uh, and I couldn't have done or what I'm presenting here without uh, the, the right and left shoulders uh, that sort of uh, Susan and Tina sort of work with me and we sort of collectively take care of the CLSA and they were also the main architects of the design of the CLSA COVID study, along with many of these investigators who are part of the CLSA team. And I've specifically highlighted some of the people who spent a lot of time with us in designing, developing and solving problems as they emerged uh, with the CLSA COVID questionnaire, and these people are highlighted in and in bold here on this slide. So before I talk about the CLSA COVID, I think some of you might not, you might be on the call who don't know uh, the CLSA platform and how this study itself was embedded within the CLSA platform. Uh, it's important for you to have a sense of what we are doing with core CLSA. So the core CLSA is developed as a research platform to, to generate data and evidence that informs not only the, the uh, public health policy, but policies at all level and advances the science of aging in this country and around the globe. Uh, just a quick overview. It is a cohort at the baseline was 50,000 people between the ages of 45 and 85. And 20,000 of these were uh, providing data through questionnaires only, and they were a random sample of the Canadian population in 10 provinces. And 30,000 is what we call a comprehensive. Uh, this is where we do much more in-depth uh, investigations. We go to the homes of the people, we collect blood samples, do, we do physical assessments at data collection and sites. And they were all, they are all established around 25 to 50 kilometer of 11 sites across uh, seven provinces. So I won't spend a whole lot of time on the CLSA, CLSA design core, but what I'm gonna be talking later on 
it will become relevant why I needed to uh, show this slide to you. And, and just to put it in the context, the, the, both the comprehensive and the CLSA, uh, they roughly started in 2011, 2012. And we finished the first baseline data collection and recruitment uh, by 2015. From 2015 to 2018, we completed our follow-up one. And 2018, we started our follow-up two. And when we were uh, in 2020 March, we actually suspended our uh, data collection because of the uh, because of the pandemic. It was right at the beginning. Even the lockdowns in most provinces started around March 16th. We had suspended the face-to-face -face data collection uh, of the follow-up to CLSA on March 8th. Uh, we pivoted, and rather than just collecting no data, we set up all our staff. Uh, in their homes uh, to collect as much data as we could uh, through uh, telephone interviews. And this is what actually was happening when we were in the middle of the follow up too. This is a, it just gives you a sense of what was going on in Canada in early 2020 in March, February to March to April. And that's the first peak and that's where many of the uh, public health measures, lockdowns, different strategies were being uh, implemented across the country. And a lot of that, that was being done not knowing what was coming uh, in, in the coming months. And then the summer months looked like they were peaks were going down and some of the areas across the country started to re relax some of the uh, lockdowns or other public health measures. And then again, as the fall started to emerge more closer to October, November, we started to see the peak for the pandemic again happen. And again, uh, all of the restrictions, all of the public health measures, people were staying in indoors in homes and it had disproportionately affected at least for the first and the beginning of the second wave uh, uh, for the elderly people, especially in the long-term care, but also in the community also. So that sort of, as this was happening and we had suspended the CLSA core face-to-face -face data collection, uh, basically uh, within a week of suspending the face-to-face -face data collection, we started to discuss whether we should be launching a CLSA COVID-19 questionnaire study. And we were fortunate to get funding from Public Health Agency of Canada. They were they are one of the major funders, along with Jurovinsky Research Institute from McMaster, uh, McMaster Provost and Vice President Research Fund, and McMaster Institute for Research and Aging. So they are the main funders of this uh, CLSA COVID-19 questionnaire study. But we also got additional funding for the Nova Scotia component from the province of uh, Nova Scotia, Susan Kirkland had applied for these funds and we were able to receive some funds to do some activities in, in that province. So we launched this study on April 15th to 2020. We actually, if I recall, first time we talked about do, doing something like this was, I was looking at my notes, it was actually on March 28th. So within roughly two weeks, we had driven our staff crazy to develop uh, software, uh, develop questionnaires, program questionnaires, and get it out in the field because it was important to capture people's perception. And originally we started this questionnaire uh, to understand the epidemiology of the infection and the psychosocial and other uh, behavioral aspects that people might experience. And so how did we recruit people? We have the core CLSA sample size is 50, little over 51,000. And over from baseline to follow up one and in the middle of the follow up two, we've had some 8,638 people who were ex excluded because of either they had disease, they require a proxy, either they have withdrawn or for some other administrative reasons, we were not able to contact them. Uh, to make the long story short, uh, our eligible sample for the COVID-19 study uh, uh, questionnaire study was roughly around 42,000 people. 
and and we got a response rate of close to 67 percent 28,559 responded to our baseline uh, COVID questionnaire and uh, this is what the design of the uh, study looked like so large proportion of uh, people in the CLSA were able to complete uh, the questionnaires uh, on the website that the web-based uh, interviews, but there were around 20% or 30% of the participants who didn't have access to uh, internet. Uh, we collected the same data uh, using phones. So the both sides had the baseline interviews. Uh, for logistic reasons, uh, the, the phone-based interviews were uh, then repeated questionnaires where our data were collected bi-weekly. And in the baseline, originally we started with weekly data collection, but quickly we realized that it was becoming quite uh, burdensome for participants. And then we also shifted that to a uh, bi weekly uh, for some period of time. And after that, we were contacting our participant monthly. Uh, and then we conducted a exit questionnaire, which uh, started in early November and finished at the end of uh, December 2020. So the data that I'm going to be presenting today in relation to this analysis I'm talking is only looking at the baseline and the exit uh, questionnaire uh, data. So the two uh, waves of data uh, during the pandemic that I will be talking about. So generally, these were the things that the CLSA COVID-19 questionnaire included. Uh, these quest questionnaires are all on our CLSA website. I don't have time to go through each and every question we have, but generally these were the constructs that we focused on. We looked at COVID symptoms. We looked at COVID status, whether they were tested positive. We looked at risk factors. We looked at their healthcare use, health behaviors, what type of public health, how they were sort of engaging or, or using different public health measures, social factors, depression and anxiety. Uh, just to be clear, depression was, anxiety was not asked at no depression and anxiety were asked both at the baseline and exit questionnaire they were not asked into the in between for the weekly and bi-weekly or early monthly questionnaires uh, we also asked them questions related to economic consequences uh, consequences and in the exit questionnaire that was done in november to december we also added additional questions uh, related to function and mobility so, as part of this, uh, this particular team of uh, researchers who we work very closely, I mentioned earlier, we started to look at analyzing different aspects of the, the data that are emerging. And, uh, and to be honest, we are still trying to understand the data and the nuances of the data. Uh, but we did focus on looking at some of the issues related to mental health, specifically uh, the, the uh, depression. So the, 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 this, the, the reason we focused on um, mental health or depression in this context was that the, the, all of this was uh, happening against the, 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 the issues of pandemic restrictions and people being isolated in their homes or restricted to their own homes, not meeting with their family members or other uh, social connection was happening with the backdrop of existing physical and mental health morbidities social isolation that existed prior to pandemic, loneliness issues, and some other people who had caregivers or family or, or, or formal caregivers losing connection with that. So the question was all of this that is happening in, in, in the context of what people already had and that these new emerging situations that were coming from the pandemic itself, how that is impacting the uh, mental health specifically uh, depression and anxiety uh, in, in older people in the CLSA. I'm only going to be talking about depression today, uh, anxiety, maybe some other times, uh, but that's what I'm focusing on for this presentation. So we sort of started to look at some of the research questions that we would like to uh, address. Obviously, we would like to look at much more uh, nuanced research questions. The, the data that we collected during the pandemic are limited because we didn't want to burden a lot of our participants. Nonetheless, 
some interesting uh, findings have emerged. Nothing unexpected, but still uh, uh, interest, interesting uh, nonetheless. So the first question that we were interested in looking at to examine the relationship between social determinants of health and health-related factors with changes in the prevalence of depression. And then we wanted to see, are these associations modified by time? And time here, I mean the pre-pandemic versus uh, during the pandemic. And, and the second question, uh, which uh, we have been working on uh, for the last little while, is looking at how the pandemic-related stressors, the data we collected during the pandemic, experienced by the older adults are associated with the severity and trajectory of the depression. So I'm going to be talking about these uh, two main questions today. Uh, just to say we use the, the, the conceptualization of depression is that we use the 10 item center uh, for epidemiological study short depression scale. This is the same scale that we have used in the core CLSA. And many of you probably know each item includes four response categories ranging from zero to three rarely or never, less than one day, some of the time one to two days, occasionally three to four days, and all of the time five to seven days. Total score ranges from zero to 30 with higher scores indicating greater number of depressive symptoms. For our analysis, we dichotomize based on the recommendation of the scale developers that if you have a score of 10 or more, uh, you are indicated to have uh, your screening for depression. and and and. Uh, that you more like most likely you have uh, depression. So this is how, for the purposes of this study, we have classified uh, depression when people have score of ten or more. Um, obviously, we did not collect all the data as part of the COVID nineteen questionnaire study. Some of the variables that I'm going to be using in my analysis was brought from our uh, baseline and follow up one. Uh, cycles of the core CLSA. And these are the covariates that uh, the, the variables that we looked at age, sex, ethnicity, household income, uh, dwelling type, living area, how many people live in your household, social participation, alcohol consumption, uh, smoking status, physical activity, number of chronic condition, loneliness. And in some situations we looked at COVID-19 status and I'll come back to that a little later. And, and to examine the first uh, objective, which was to look at the relationship between social determinants and health related factors, uh, we uh, obviously did some descriptive analysis and I will provide some overarching picture what the data actually looks like. And then we also did uh, um, uh, a weighted generalized estimating equation analysis, which is basically a, a logistic regression modeling that accounts the longitudinal data and specifically, um, and it allows modeling for change in prevalence of depression, depression over time. And it's important to note that this does not look at individual level change. It only looks at population level change uh, in, in the uh, depression. The reason we uh, used uh, weighted GE, that it allows, uh, allows one to handle uh, missing data when it is missing at random in a much easier fashion, as long as the missing data are monotonic. What I mean by monotonic is if we had a missing data at baseline of the CLSA core, but we had data from individuals from follow-up one and during the COVID, this model can't handle that type of a missing data. For every person, we have to have a baseline value present. And the, the flexibility that the GE framework allows that you can use wide variety of link function. And in this case, uh, we use the logistic link function. And this analysis was performed on 39,604 individuals. And these are the people who had the uh, monotonic pattern of missing data. And then we defined time period as a pre COVID 19 period as data from the CLSA baseline and follow up and COVID-19 baseline and COVID-19 exit questionnaire. So there are, uh, in this particular analysis, four, uh, three time points that we consider. And age was considered as a time varying covariate in the analysis. And then we also looked at uh, interactions that, that sort of answers the questions related to the interaction between uh, period and some of the demographic or 
social and health related factors. And this gives you a, just a bit of an overarching picture of, uh, of the data. And this is CLSA baseline, CLSA follow-up, CLSA COVID-19 baseline, and CLSA COVID-19 exit questionnaire. And you can see the sample sizes across the top, and it sort of tells you a little bit about the uh, distribution uh, by age, by sex, by household income, and the, and what, what the number of people who uh, uh, screen positive or negative for depression on the CSD 10 scale. Uh, just to keep in mind, in the in the CLSA base, COVID-19 baseline or COVID exit questionnaire, we did not ask the income household income question. So the numbers you see are from the using the the data from the follow up one. The 3.84 and 3.80 that is based on the on the follow up one income data. So first, looking at some of the uh, uh, of the the longitudinal descriptive analysis, the this is a change in prevalence of depression by period of the top part top chart and the bottom one is uh, for sex. And here you can see that at the baseline uh, that the that the positive depression was around 13%. It was roughly the same at follow-up one, but then it jumped to almost 20% at the CLSA COVID in 19 baseline and a little bit more, but roughly the same at the COVID-19 exit questionnaire. And if you look at uh, 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 by sex, that the, the relative increase in, in female was much higher uh, than male, but both sexes had an increase in, in, the, in the depression. And if we look at by age group, and here we see that, uh, again, you see the uh, CLSA baseline, which is the blue bar, orange is the follow-up one, gray is the baseline COVID, and, uh, and the green is COVID exit. You see actually the relative increase in, in depression scores or depression uh, screen positive was much, much higher in the younger age groups than it was in the uh, older age groups, but it, it, it happened across all age groups in, in our data. And this is the one of the interesting slides that even though it's a descriptive, it also holds true when we do a multivariate analysis, change in pre prevalence uh, 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 in depression by period and household income. If you see the less than 20,000 uh, uh, group of people, they had high depression uh, uh, proportions even prior to the COVID-19. They went up a little bit, but they were already at the high end of it. So the relative increase there was not that big. However, if you look at the higher side of the income, which is 150,000 or over 100,000, you basically see that the jump was much higher, but still much less than the low income people on the whole. So it, it affected all sorts of people, but it, if it, 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 the, the pandemic affected the mental health of uh, low income uh, groups substantially because they already started at a higher level. And then we sort of started to look at other social participation and living status. Uh, you can see that depression rates were already higher with people with low social participation prior to the pandemic and went up substantially uh, during the pandemic. And it also affected people who had high social participation, but not as much as it affected the low social participation group of people. And here you can see the people who were much more impacted by the pandemic in relation to depression were living alone versus not living alone. And, and if we look at the, the marker of health we used here was the number of chronic condition, the notion of the multimorbidity. Again, substantive impact as the number of chronic conditions that people reported having, and this is all coming from the baseline, uh, they, they, those group of people had a higher uh, impact in relation to the mental health issues but it was again happening across all 
uh, all groups uh, on this slide. So after this descriptive analysis, we have decided to look at uh, the, the, the uh, weighted GE analysis where we wanted to see some of the adjusted relationships because what I showed you before uh, were not adjusted for anything. Those were mostly descriptive. And here, the, the first, the, these are the five stars I have picked for the discussion purposes here that you can see that in comparison to the baseline, uh, co, uh, the uh, comparison between the COVID-19 baseline depression score in relation to the pre-COVID depression score, the odds were roughly around 1.8. And from COVID-19 exit to pre-COVID-19 was almost two. So basically what it is saying that the people went up, their odds of getting depression did go up in comparison to the pre-pandemic time period. But over the eight month period, the 10 month period when we were collecting data, it didn't go up. It actually stayed pretty high. If anything, it went up a little bit. It will be interesting if we are able to collect additional data in the coming months to see what happens with the current pandemic wave that we are seeing uh, to, the, to the people's uh, mental health. Here again, as I mentioned before, the younger age groups had a higher odds, uh, low income groups, um, again, uh, three or more chronic condition, twice as likely to report having depression and loneliness, which I didn't show you the descriptive, uh, was one of the uh, stronger uh, uh, risk factor for for experiencing uh, depressive symptoms uh, during the uh, pandemic. And then we started to look at some of the interactions that I mentioned earlier on. Here you see that again, if you look at the time period, that is the uh, COVID-19 baseline versus the pre-COVID-19, and we look at the interaction between the time period and the income variable, let's say here, that's the second bar, the chart at the bottom of this slide. You can see the people in this, the, the, the lowest uh, income group in comparison to the highest income group had odds ratios of four. So there, it, it disproportionately impacted people in, in low income groups, even though it was also higher in higher income groups, but it had a disproportional impact in the low income uh, groups. And this pattern was seen with all sorts of different, uh, uh, you see that up on the top slide, um, male versus female. Again, female experienced much uh, higher uh, odds of experiencing um, uh, uh, depressive symptoms. And you see this pattern with multitudes of uh, factors, but not as strong as what we saw in relation to income. Again, low versus high social participation, two and a half to almost 2.8 uh, odds ratio, living alone versus not living around two. And, and some of these things either went up with time or sustained themselves at the same uh, level. Uh, here, whether you are looking, living in a household standalone house, or you're living in an apartment or some sort of a congregate setting type of uh, a living arrangement, uh, your odds ratio for experiencing depression was much higher in comparison to people who were living in detached homes. Again, here you see the, the differential impact of chronic conditions over time uh, in, uh, uh, pre, in relation to the pre-pandemic to during pandemic. And, uh, and as the time went on, the, the impact of the chronic condition actually start, started to be, uh, get a little stronger. Here we have our odds ratio, I think, uh, 4.5 versus uh, 4. So that was the data related to the first research question. And, and the second question that we were interested in was looking at how the pandemic related stressors experienced by older adults are associated with severity and trajectory of the depression. So this is a slightly different take on the same question. So the, what is the, when I'm talking about uh, the, the, the stressors that people experience during pandemic, uh, there was a series of questions that we asked in our baseline as well as in the exit questionnaire, 
uh, related to different forms of stressors that people might have experienced. Health stressors, whether they were themselves ill, someone close to them was ill, or somebody died. Uh, difficulty with accessing resources, loss of income, uh, unable to access necessary supplies of food, unable to access uh, usual health care or get prescription medicine, medications, questions about conflict, whether there was a verbal or physical conflict, separation from family, and caregiver responsibility. So we sort of, this was not categorized like this in the questions that we asked, but these are the labels that for our analysis purposes, we have given calling them health stressors, uh, difficult accessing resources, conflict, separation from family, and caregiving responsibilities. And, and as at the bottom of the slide, we say that these experience were grouped as a, yes, if the participants endorsed at least one experience in this specific category, and if they said no, uh, then they were uh, classified as a, uh, that no was not endorsing any category in that uh, group of uh, uh, stressors that we have uh, defined here. And here we actually looked at a slightly different type of analysis. This was a uh, latent class growth modeling. It is a group-based modeling strategy which uh, identifies distinct classes of individuals who follow a similar pattern of depression in this particular analysis over the four time periods, that is CLSA baseline, CLSA first follow-up, COVID-19 baseline, and COVID-19 exit. Uh, these trajectories were modeled using a proc uh, procedure in the, uh, in the SAS. And uh, uh, COVID-19 stressor experiences, loneliness, and all of the covariates which we wanted to address for that we saw in previous analysis were added to the model. Uh, model selection involves a bit of uh, iterative estimation and some qualitative judgment, and but mostly uh, we use some of these uh, fit, fitting model criteria to determine which is a good fitting model and which is the model that we want to uh, pursue. One of the advantages of, advantages of this uh, growth modeling, uh, uh, this latent class growth modeling is that uh, when we have multiple groups, uh, depending on what the shape of the curve uh, might look like, you can use a linear term, quadratic term, or a cubic to fit the best fit, fitting model. In our case, it was actually came down to linear or a quadrating ter term, depending on what particular uh, group we were looking at. So uh, this is where the latent class, it looks at the data, it defines, it tells us that the, there are three underlying categories of uh, uh, groups of people that experience uh, depression. And uh, based on the best fitting model, we actually define this into three categories, or three groups of trajectories. The bottom one is the red one is the low and consistent. They, they were fairly low, but didn't change much over time. The green one is a moderate and increasing. And then the high is, uh, the blue one is high and increasing substantially. Just to remind you, based on the CSD, anyone who has a score of 10 and over is classified as having depressive symptom. And you see the high and increasing all have scores higher than 10. And the dotted lines are 95% confidence intervals around each one of these trajectories. Again, uh, just to keep in mind that this is not defining an individual level trajectory. This analysis also looks at a group of people who belong to that particular trajectory. The interpretation of the result is at a group level, not at the individual level. Um, so, Focusing on the, uh, these are the, all other the variables that we adjusted for. And this was quite interesting. Majority of the uh, health related stressors did have impact on, uh, on individuals. And here, what we are doing is the first set of columns I had, we are uh, taking the, uh, this uh, green line, moderate, comparing it with the red one, and then comparing the blue one uh, with the red one. That's why where the uh, comparison happens. So here, uh, after the, the groups of trajectories have been defined, uh, we basically ended up running a multinomial logistic regression 
And here, comparing the moderate increasing group to the low increasing group, uh, these are the uh, odds ratios linked to different uh, uh, categories of uh, stressors. And here, the interesting part is that the conflict stressor was almost four times uh, of uh, in the moderate in comparison to the low, but that that uh, uh, effect size or odds ratio goes to almost eight. So substantive impact on the uh, on the mental health of the people who are actually going through a conflict, whether it is in the same household or outside the household, we were not able to differentiate, but it shows uh, there is a substantive impact. And then the again, loneliness uh, issue is a substantive risk factor, especially for people who already had a higher level of depressive symptoms prior to experiencing uh, the pandemic and going from uh, five from a moderate to low to almost 15 uh, odds ratios of 15 for that group. So this, this analysis gives you a bit of a different perspective that sort of looks at the severity of the depression and how that depression sort of uh, impacts over time uh, through these trajectories uh, when related to these specific uh, variables. So that's all I had uh, to say today. Uh, basically in conclusion, COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant impact on the mental health of older people. And uh, I think it's important to know uh, that especially the young old, the 55 to 64 year old actually uh, had higher uh, proportion of depressive symptoms. Um, our results show that the prevalence of depression increased during the pandemic as compared to the pre-pandemic. Uh, and the increase, and it sustained itself through the eight or nine month uh, follow up that we did during the pandemic. Increase in depression is not evenly distributed. It disproportionately impacts uh, some of the socially disadvantaged or people who have health issues. Uh, and the group of individuals who experience pandemic related stresses such as conflict had much higher odds of being in a group that had the worst trajectory or depression. So, uh, I will stop here and hopefully we can, I wanted to leave some time for uh, question answers if there are some interest from the group, but I, I gather that there is some CLSA propaganda material here as well. Here is a, on the CLSA website, we have a COVID-19 dashboard where you can go and see other variables, descriptive data on our COVID questionnaires and we will be adding additional follow-up uh, question. I think this is still uh, based on the baseline uh, COVID, but others are coming. And secondly, uh, there's, we have uh, decided to release the, the CLSA COVID questionnaire data to research community, and some of you have probably applied as part of the current deadline that just recently closed. So they are available to other researchers to access for future research questions. And in the CLSA core is funded by CIHR and CFI and many of the provinces and universities across the country. Thank you. Thank you, Perminder, for the uh, excellent presentation as always. I'd like to now open it up to questions. Uh, just a reminder, muting will remain on, but you can enter your questions into the chat box in the bottom right corner of the WebEx window. Um, I didn't see any questions yet, but I'm sure there will. Here they come. They're starting. Um, so we have a question from uh, Theodora. Uh, what was the number of females and males in the study? And then also maybe you can comment if uh, the difficulties because of language barriers and not knowing the system. So here, this slide shows uh, what the distribution by sex is. So you can see uh, the CLSA core itself have roughly 51% female, and that is similar to that in follow-up one. In the COVID baseline, we had around 52 and COVID-19, 53. So that's the uh, male to female uh, ratio in the CLSA and during the uh, COVID questionnaire. Uh, what was the uh, other question was, please repeat what conflict refers to. This was a single question we had in the CLSA that asked people about 
um, about whether during this pandemic period they uh, experienced an increased verbal or physical conflict. So that's what I labeled uh, that that construct as a conflict. It might not be the right label. That that's what we ended up la labeling. So it is based on a single question uh, uh, that we sort of uh, looking at that data. Do you remember what the question was, Perminder? There's a question. Uh, what? How was the conflict question worded, and when was that question asked? It, this was, was it asked. asked Pardon me, it was asked at the CLSA COVID baseline and then repeated at the CLSA COVID exit. And the question was, the which of the following have you experienced during the COVID-19 pandemic? And then it asked these experiences that I've listed in on this slide. And the question was, have you experienced uh, increased verbal or physical conflict? It doesn't ask inside the family or outside the family, it just simply phrases the question in that fashion. Um, another question we have is understanding that data analysis continues. What ideas have emerged about how to mitigate depression and anxiety across these age groups? Well, we are barely scratching the data. And so right now we are looking at, uh, I think, uh, obviously, some of the mitigation strategies that will have to be targeted uh, are going to be how it differentially have impacted uh, young old uh, people in low income groups, what kind of support structures they need in order to manage uh, some of the stressors that they have uh, experienced. I haven't really thought about what would be the interventions or strategy that would be needed to mitigate. Uh, our goal up to now has been thinking about where are the, these uh, risk factors and who's being impacted more than others? And the people who work in the area of uh, mitigation might have to look at these data and say, ah, these might be the strategies that might happen. Obviously, if we look at the uh, caregiving issues in this particular slide that is on the uh, screen, it has impacted substantially older people because they are not able to see their grandchildren, their children, or their other loved ones. So the question is, if we have to go through this type of uh, uh, crisis situation again, I bet we can and should be able to come up with plans that the caregivers, especially the care, family caregivers, become part of the care system of the older people who might be living alone or might be living in the uh, institutional setting. Mind you, in our data, we we not looked at the institutional setting because. These are all community developing people, but nonetheless, the issue remains the same. Low income side, I guess people have to deal with multiple issues in relation to not having resources, maybe living in small spaces, maybe living in multi generational households. There might be multitudes of other factors that might be driving uh, their uh, mental health uh, issues in relation to the pandemic. So this is just scratching the surface. There are lots more to be done. Whether CLSA can answer all those questions <coughs> remains to be seen. <coughs> but that, those are some of my thoughts at this point in time. And I think that touches on one question that we had about um, um, what what the findings may may recommend for agencies working with seniors in the community and also prevention. Anything else related to that that you might uh, I, I think what, what it indicates is that the, the seniors who are in the low income households require special attention. So there needs to be some targeting done there. Uh, other one is the seniors who were lonely. I, I think that again emerges as a uh, important factor. We do have to make sure that we community organizations or public health agency of Canada or provincial agency think about uh, that the loneliness that existed prior to the pandemic, how that actually increased the risk of some of the uh, mental health issues, and how do we think about providing that support to those people in these very, very difficult times? So uh, I think you can pick multiple areas where story is that people need support, and, and how do you provide that support that supports them uh, through this time uh, becomes uh, critical. 
Uh, it's also, and I know some of our colleagues are looking at analysis, it's also interesting that the mental health issues are much more prominent in younger people. Maybe we need to do some additional analysis and understand the resiliency of our older people here, that their, their depression rates didn't go up as much as uh, some of the younger people. And I think there are other things to be explored here. Yeah. Okay, switching gears to some of the uh, the the data you presented, just a question about the odds ratios and whether they were significant because um, they didn't see uh, p values. Well, I will first say I'm not a big fan of p values. That's why we provided confidence interval. But to give you a sense that if you are interested in p values, all of them were significant, except for one that change after we adjusted for the loneliness and that was the living alone variable that became non-significant but everything else was pretty much uh, associated statistically with the outcome and what about the impact of the cognitive status of participants um, we haven't looked at that yeah we that's what i thought that. okay um, working through there would be some analysis that we might look at in the future the their previous cognitive history, but we didn't collect cognitive data as part of the COVID questionnaire. But as you know, we are still collecting data as part of the follow up too. And there's close to 8,000 or so people or 10,000 people on whom we have collected questionnaire data during pandemic, including telephone bat batteries of uh, uh, COVID. So we probably have opportunity once the follow up to data become available to address some of those questions as well. So I'm going to read this next one. It's rather lengthy. Do you know if any of the other international longitudinal studies on aging were set in locations that chose to adopt different public health measures at the outset of the pandemic? Uh, they add that it is distressing, if not surprising, to see the extent to which mental health was eroded and so important moving forward to be better prepared to respond to future disasters. Comparative analyses with other settings could be helpful. Any comment uh, on that? Well, it is, first of all, it's really hard to figure out what strategies, what different jurisdictions or countries used. Uh, we couldn't even figure that part out easily in Canada across provinces. It's a very hard thing to get data to determine what happened. Um, one of the things that other studies, there are other studies that have come out and have shown the impact on the mental health of older individuals in different countries. But majority of the study, maybe there's one or two other studies that I have looked at, have looked at or collected data just during the pandemic. They didn't have the data related to the pre-pandemic period that we have uh, the advantage in relation to the, to the CLSA. So the, the, the comparative analysis between pre-pandemic and during pandemic gives a, a special of, uh, I guess, interpretation of the CLSA data, but the data that have been collected longitudinally over time during pandemic are showing pretty much the same pattern in different parts of the world. So it is not just that there is something in Canada uh, that is happening. This is the same pattern uh, people are seeing in other countries as well. I, I, but I, even in countries like uh, Australia, there's a paper that has come out of Australia, which did not have as stringent uh, our public health measures for a longer period of time as we did here in other countries. But the, the during the lockdown, they experienced the same, same impact. I haven't seen data during the opening, after the opening up of the the restrictions, but the earlier on, the patterns were the same. Another question here, you have a higher, you have a higher proportion of over 75 people for COVID baseline and exit compared with earlier waves. Could that contribute to higher percent of depression for COVID baseline and exit? Um, so there's two things happening, and that's a good point, that's uh, the question that remember we are picking people from the core CLSA and CLSA is aging. So we have 
taken that into account. So that, that, the, that the higher proportion of people in older age groups as a function of the design of the CLSA, that's what I was trying to say. With the age increase, we actually adjusted for age as a time varying covariate. When we are looking at some of the relationship with loneliness or income and other factors, that is adjusted for age as a time covariate a factor. So I personally don't think that is the reason that we would have seen a higher proportion. First of all, I don't think we see a higher proportion of depression in the oldest age group. We see it in the youngest, but I whatever we see in that age group is not just function because we have more people in the 75 uh, age group. At least that's how I am answering that question right now. I will have to think about it a bit more. Okay. Um, we have another question about uh, separation from families and that she says, I am surprised that separation from families did not figure more prominently into your results during COVID lockdown. Any thoughts as to why? Well, we have, this is the analysis I presented and separation from family showed a fairly moderate impact on the uh, trajectories of worsening mental health. So, we, w do we have a much more elaborate data in the CLSA? No. Simple question uh, that people responded. Uh, I think uh, some of these questions might be better answered with the uh, when we have CLSA follow up to data because the questions are about the family separation or caregiving a bit more nuanced in our data collection than they are in this one. But even with this single question, uh, at least in the community developing, at least the participants that are uh, contributing to this data had an increased odds ratio, but not as high as, let's say, conflict or loneliness. Um. Related to that, I, I just wanted to say, if I remove the loneliness variable from the map model, the separation from family does go a little higher in its effect sizes. So loneliness probably explains majority of it. And what about data on perceived stress levels? Um, do you have data about perceived stress levels? I'm trying to remember. I can't. I mm -hmm. don't think so. I don't think we collected that as part of the COVID questionnaires. But yeah, if I don't I'd think it was right part of COVID, but yeah. maybe main wave. Uh, no, we don't have a perceived stress yeah. in the main waves. We have we can create a perceived stress variable in the previous from the previous waves, but there is no single questionnaire that asks the perceived stress per se. We're getting towards the end of the uh, hour and there's just a few questions left. If I just wanted to note, if we didn't, if we don't get to your question, uh, we can follow up with you via email with, uh, with some further comments about it. Uh, a question from Larry Chambers, which I, I'm not surprised he's asking this question. What actions are, how, what actions of government are informed by these results, if any? And we have. Well, there I been any work to touched on this question already earlier on. I think what this data identifies that, that the mental health of older people or the people over the age of 50, people over the age of 50 in the CLSA is not affecting people equally. There is a population heterogeneity. There is a uh, different social determinants of health that the, the different social factors impact people differently. So I think these data uh, not necessarily identify anything new, but uh, reinforce that the pandemic, we know from the infection point of view, it has impacted population very differentially. And the same thing is happening in the context of the uh, issue like mental health. It, it affects people very differently. People might be riding the uh, same storm, but they're all in different boats in, 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 in context of mental health. And, and I think that's what these data reaffirm to some extent. It identifies uh, some, of the, uh, some of the new things, for example, that uh, which to me was surprising that 
even after the first lockdown, when we uh, had the uh, easing of the lockdown, the depression uh, proportions of people with depression remained pretty high. It didn't go down. Question is how long it will take before uh, people start to feel uh, uh, back to their original mental health, or is it something they're going to uh, have this for a long period of time. We have some uh, PTSD measures in the CLSA that will be interesting to look in the future, how it has, what impact, tra traumatic impact it has on uh, people's lives. But I think that these data, I, at least to me, it emphasizes that, 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 that the, the lockdown of public health measure, which are important to have uh, to prevent infection, has had a differential impact on different groups of people, and the mitigation strategies have to be targeted at those uh, groups of people. And mental health issues, depression issues are, are important. We are doing some other analyses in relation to persistence of symptoms. You see that again, same population heterogeneity and differential impact on, on, on uh, groups of people from low income to high income, males to females, people living alone versus not living alone. So it is a pattern uh, that is the social disadvantaged groups are really ex have a experienced uh, or costed them heavily, not only from infection, but from uh, other consequences of the pandemic, including mental health. So maybe some of the strategies have to target those individuals going forward. Okay, well, it's 101. I just want to also remind everyone before people start to leave, if you can please uh, complete the poll uh, before you leave. Um, I think a, a good way to end Parminder um, is uh, two last questions. One that was asked initially. I, I do. I'm sorry. I have a call with the minister, so I do have to go. Um, when will the results be published? That's what I was going to ask. Well, the first paper, the, the the GE analysis is under review right now. We'll see if anybody accepts it. And the other, okay. the second objective is being written up. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. And to everyone who we didn't answer your questions, we will follow up with you. Um, a few closing remarks before people start to leave. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that CLSA data access request applications are ongoing. The next deadline is September 8th. Uh, if you can visit our website under data access to review the available data and in, in including any of the COVID-19 questionnaire study data, as well as additional details about the application process. Um, I already reminded you to complete your survey. Uh, the upcoming webinar uh, for May is uh, entitled long-term cognitive impairment following concussion findings from the CLSA. It will be presented by Dr. Mark Bedard, who recently defended his uh, PhD thesis in clinical psychology at the University of Ottawa, Ottawa. You can visit our website to register for that if you're interested. And remember, the CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. And we invite you to follow us on Twitter at, at CLSA underscore ELCV. Um, thank you again for attending our presentation today. I know we're a couple minutes over, uh, but uh, we look forward to seeing you and Dr. Bedard at the next webinar. Thanks, everyone.